Welcome back to Gatabud. This is my Brutal Challenge Rulers of the Outer World video. We are entering the home stretch on completing Seven Star Inn, and this is one of the hardest battles to get through. If you watched my last video, the setup is nearly identical. I did this with Cloud, Aerith, and Yuffie doing my limit siphon strategy. It went really, really well. And there are a couple of important details I need to share, but I'm gonna show you my entire equip setup. Cloud has the enhanced expeditionary metal to give him instant level three limit break at the start of battle. He has enemy skill and HP absorption in lieu of chakra. And then healing and revival, MP, HP, ATB boost, first strike, ATB stagger, ATB assist, skill master, limit siphon, and then defensive fire and ice. I'm using the umbral blade where I use defense plus 50, reprieve, max HP plus 200, and limit gauge guard. I actually goofed up and got the accessories wrong here. Um, I just got done doing a hard mode chapter, so Aerith had the Koopo charm on, and <laughs> that is hilarious and useless. If I did this correctly, she would have had the ribbon, and Yuffie would have had the enhanced karmic cowl so the materia is revival materia limit support materia healing materia with magnify hp mp atb boost first strike lightning and wind just to throw spells at things magic up re-raise ATB stagger and then elemental fire on defense just like cloud. I have on the weapon Gamban Tien, ATB charge rate up, reprieve, ATB limit, and spiritual harvest. Now I must note ATB limit is the level 9 perk which means you have every single manuscript for Aerith. I wouldn't consider this a prerequisite, but if you're trying to equip it and you can't see it, that's why. Yuffie incorrectly had the ribbon equipped for my run, as I mentioned on Aerith. She should have had the enhanced karmic cowl. And then I had magnify time, swift cast healing, HP MP, revival, subversion, re-raise, barrier magnified, and then fire elemental her weapon was the fuma shuriken which had atb charge rate up magic power plus 20 attack power plus 20 and shuriken mastery round one is about as easy as it gets with elemental fire on defense on all three characters phoenix will be constantly healing you and what you have to do here is defeat kujata and then defeat phoenix and then defeat kujata again and until you've defeated phoenix you're basically getting free cures this entire time and then you're just one-on-one -on -one with Kujata, who alone at this point with everything you've learned is an absolute walk in the park. So for this round, the voiceover is going to be a review on this overall battle strategy and mindset that we are employing here. There are a lot of reasons why I chose Aerith and Yuffie to accompany Cloud, but the biggest one is because of how good they both are with MP. You might notice there's not a single prayer or chakra in my builds, and that is by design. You want to start off every battle by getting established. And what I mean by that is laying down Aerith's wards and using three ATB charges on both Yuffie and Aerith, 
and activating the infinite MP synergy skill. Once active, I immediately do an MP free magnify mana wall. If there's any health that needs to be recovered, I do a Curaga. Next, I cast Re-Raise on everyone in the party for free. When appropriate, I will unleash offensive spells. And then as it's expiring, I will attempt to reapply Mana Wall for free again to extend its duration and also try to refresh haste and if applicable, even get a regen or cast another Curon. And then once you are set up like this effectively, you are extremely hard to defeat. The biggest vulnerability in this strategy is when you get off to a bad start and you are trying to constantly recover, it can be tough to get back into the game. Now, on the other side of the strategy, the lion's share of your damage is going to come from Cloud's Limit Break 3. While you are getting set up and established, you're also taking some damage and building the limit gauges as well. As soon as Cloud and Yuffie can combine for one full limit gauge, you use Limit Siphon on Cloud and then start your offensive assault. Additionally, with all of the ATB materials that Cloud has equipped, doing things like a double focus thrust will send ATB to Yuffie and Eric. One of the biggest tips I have is if you are about to stagger the enemy and you have a limit ready to go, you need to go ahead and use that limit as the act that staggers the enemy because of the materials equipped that's going to give you limit back once that stagger has happened. If you don't do that, you're essentially leaving free limit gauge on the table. Now, Aerith has the materia equipped that causes her limit gauge to be gifted to Yuffie and Cloud, which speeds up this process. And the only time I really miss Aerith's limit is when things are going really, really wrong and I'm trying to mount a comeback, or on an enemy like Sephiroth at the end where planet's protection would come in super clutch. But I stand by that decision. I think that the benefits of getting limit faster outweigh the cons here. And lastly, when you are using the limit, it is a tremendous opportunity to do all the other things as well, like the synergy skill because when the enemy is getting demolished by cloud's limit it's also not messing with you and attacking you so use them in tandem to your advantage to get everyone healthy and know that you have about 15 seconds of cloud being indestructible Many times in this video, you will see me fire off Cloud's Limit in very red HP and in some examples, literally at one HP thanks to the Umbral Blade's Reprieve. I don't think I would have won this battle without the Umbral Blade. It can be very tempting to want to equip the Sleek Saber and get real fast and loose but this is just simply not the battle to try and do that, unfortunately. Situationally, I will sometimes deviate and use other synergy skills, but I typically only want to be using the infinite MP synergy skill, even if I've already used it twice. Congrats on an easy round one win. We are on to round two. Round two on this is also pretty easy. You can get through this no problem, even if you get Giga Flared, as long as you have your mana wall up. This battle starts with Titan having something on it called the Pulse of Defiance, and you want to focus on destroying that before you can damage Bahamut. 
As always, I'm putting a heavy focus early on getting established and getting all my wards and buffs up to ensure that this is a smooth battle. One thing in particular that Bahamut does that is annoying is it has a move that will slow you, so that can mess with you having haste up. But that also makes ATB Ward that much more valuable here because that cannot be dispelled and it becomes a massive asset. Additionally, if you are slowed, using Cloud's ATB Materias to give ATB to others and regain is also extremely useful to counteract that. Titan in particular is weak to wind, so using Yuffie's Wind Ninjutsu inside the ATB ward is a solid decision here and you will be dealing a lot of damage and getting a lot of ATB ready for everyone. One mistake that I made here is I was not paying attention to Mana Wall wearing off and in a little bit that almost cost me this battle in kind of a sloppy way. So you need to pay attention to that because Titan is going to abruptly use his ultimate move. And if you're not at full HP, it's going to take you out. In all likelihood though, you're finally going to take out the Pulse of Defiance once you finally have enough limit gathered for Cloud to siphon Yuffie and start firing off his limit break. The only reason that I did not wipe here is because I basically had full HP. Which brings me back to some general theories about this setup. One of the benefits of my strategy is when things are going poorly and you're not effectively getting established and taking a ton of damage, your limit gauge rises very quickly and it can assist you in the rebound and can even in a weird way speed up the fight. And that's exactly what we have here. Cloud is able to siphon Yuffie and fire off a full level 3 limit on a vulnerable Titan and really kick this fight into the next gear. I kind of just ignore Bahamut here and get rid of Titan. A lot of people will tell you to beat Bahamut first, but I'd rather just focus on him one on one. I will say though that me using the synergy skill on Titan while staggered was a little bit of a tactical mistake. You want to save your synergy skills and use them on Bahamut to pressure him. Titan finally goes down though, and Bahamut has been damaged halfway just by getting kind of caught in the crossfire with the level 3 limits. Now for Bahamut specifically, my biggest tip is the best time to use a synergy ability is when he starts charging his particle beam and you have to destroy the wings. If you use the Synergy skill on one of the wings and take your other character and do a full assault on the other wing, you will pressure it and destroy both wings and start to really do a number on it. And in case you missed it, if you have Mana Wall up, then Giga Flare won't one-shot you. It will do half damage, and it's really not a big deal if you get Giga Flared, as long as Mana Wall is up. Now, some insurance here is definitely re-raise. I would recommend having re-raise on your party. I personally try not to use the level 3 limit while you have the enemy staggered. I feel that part of its value is giving you 10 to 15 seconds of uninterrupted actions while the enemy is not staggered. That's a personal preference though. I don't feel as if the staggered damage bonus is that important because the final hit will do quad nines often anyways. Without Titan messing with you though, Bahamut goes down extremely quickly and we are on to round three and it's time to get serious now. No more mistakes. 
as you finish this battle, if you burned a lot of MP, try to spam Soul Drain and Purification and top off Aerith and Yuffie's MP to the best of your ability. You're going to need it moving forward. Round three, ding ding. This is where it starts to get real. If you didn't watch part one with Phoenix and you haven't heard me elaborate on the nuances of this setup and strategy, I would say that that's very helpful. I don't want to get repetitive. I want to focus on this fight. I'm going to try to simplify Odin for you. You want to hit it with ATB skills, and you want to avoid being hit with ATB skills, and then he doesn't one-shot you. Sounds simple, right? Not really. I open this with two triple slashes to try to get a head start on dealing the ATB damage. Triple slash in particular is great because you might end up dodging something while triple slashing. ATB ward is crucial and you have to spend one of your precious early ATBs on that. Don't let it get interrupted. You're going to have to make a tough personal decision here and it's going to vary depending on how the fight's going so far, even a minute in. You have to choose between buffing yourself or doing things like throwing shooting stars at it to try to reduce the Zantetsuken count. For me personally, I did do haste with Yuffie, but you also see me do stuff like use Soul Drain on Aerith just for that goal. I did a really good job here on accomplishing that goal, and I did force Sleepner's Furor here, which is what is the cause of Odin pressuring himself. That gives me a wonderful opportunity to try and stagger this guy and make this opener about as easy as it gets. When he's pressured, it's crazy how quickly his stagger gauge will increase and you want to mount an all-out offense and completely ignore defense to try to force this to happen as quickly as possible. I did manage to pull that off while basically running on fumes health and buff wise. And honestly, while Odin staggered, I kind of don't even care about dealing damage. I'm more concerned about using that as an opportunity to be able to breathe and do buffs and get things like re-raise up. I finally allowed a sloppy death to cloud and it was at the perfect moment, honestly, because if you are going to have that happen, now's the time after you've staggered Odin. Now, either after he has been staggered or after he has used Zantetsuken, Odin will vanish and you will get Alexander one-on-one -on -one for quite a while. Alexander by himself is not a very difficult threat. He will annoy you, but he won't necessarily threaten you most of the time unless you get divine judgmented without mana wall up. Your goal for this round is to eliminate Alexander's two arms, try to deal quite a bit of damage to him, you want to use your infinite MP synergy skill and make sure that you are fully buffed, including re-raise times three. And you want to put yourself in a really good position to where when Odin re-emerges, you are in a really good place to be able to take them both out at once. I also would recommend saving your limit if possible, if you're kind of later in this process, for when Odin returns as well, because you can hit both Alexander and Odin with a quad nine attack. This is also a really good opportunity to make sure that Aerith is fully prepped for a big time assault. You want all her wards up, and you also want to be charging Tempest. One thing that I didn't do here that can speed this up is using Lightning Ninjutsu and also using Thundaga if you have that equipped to Aerith. 
I would only use Thundaga while in the infinite MP buff, though. I would not cast it by itself. Remember that Arcane Ward will have your offensive spell cast twice. That's a major asset. This battle played out really well in the fact that I was able to stagger Alexander before he was able to get Divine Judgment off. That's a way to interrupt him charging that up. And I'm really just using this stagger to do my final preparations for Odin's return. I want to fire off some big attacks very quickly once he reemerges. Now, unfortunately, if you interrupt Divine Judgment, it only kind of delays the inevitable. Once he gets out of the stagger, he's going to go right back into that. So unless you are close to finishing him off, then you need to make sure that Man Wall is up and you are at full health and then Divine Judgment is no big deal. So that's exactly what happens here. And I made a little bit of an error firing off the limit early. I was anticipating Odin re-emerging after the stagger. So I jumped the gun on that a little bit, but it's not a big deal here. The important thing is I'm going to eat this Divine Judgment and not have any issues. Additionally, I have Infinite MP to immediately cast a Kiraga after it fires off, so I'm in really good shape. I make an interesting decision here for Yuffie to start throwing Firagas at Alexander. I mean, if you've got Infinite MP, damage is damage, so why not? Odin does re-emerge right after Divine Judgment, though, and I am ready to greet Odin properly with a level 3 limit immediately. And that Fyraga took Alexander's health low enough to where Alexander was just killed in the crossfire of that limit. I now have Odin one-on-one. -on -one. I'm fully buffed. I'm fully re-raised. There's a lot of good things going on now. And it's really amazing how much easier Odin is when you are one-on-one -on -one and you are prepared. Odin is very generous to me and uses Sleepner's Furor pretty quickly after returning. And he's pretty much begging me to take him out. And ask and you shall receive. I stagger Odin. I'm ready to fire off more level 3 limits. I am just ready for a win here, and I'm not going to take my foot off the gas pedal. Now, at this point in the battle, when you've got Odin almost dead, you are going to want to attempt to get everyone's health as close to full as possible before you finish off Odin, because you want to go into the next battle in a really good spot because you need to get off to a terrific start and having the cure is not what you want. And unfortunately, this is the first part of this round three that I start to do a bad job. I let Odin really mess with me while I'm trying to accomplish that goal. So what's going to happen is I'm going to reluctantly decide to just finish off Odin and deal with the fact that I'm going to enter round four with some HP loss and I'm just going to have to deal with it. It is what it is, but getting a really good and convincing win against Odin is never a bad thing. I'm very happy about that and I'm ready to try to win this thing. Getting off to a really good start against Gilgamesh is your number one priority, and to be quite honest, I did not do a good job on that here. Your immediate goals should be to get ATB Ward up, you want to get everyone as close to full health as possible, and you want to get Mana Wall up. And you don't want to delay doing Mana Wall because you want to conserve MP. You need to just fire this one off without the infinite MP buff. 
The primary implications of my early screw-ups were that I left a lot of my valuable ATB gains on the table and not used effectively. So I'm having to do things like burn a Curaga and I still don't have ATB board up. And I have to just make tough choices here. Staying alive is more important than setting yourself up for success. You can't be successful if you're already dead, unfortunately. I think I attempt to do ATB ward several times and fail and waste my ATB. And especially on that later attempt where I have Aerith far away, that one was particularly frustrating. And then I try to go in and do the double focus thrust with cloud and I also get interrupted there. It's just nothing but frustration. Nothing is working for me so far. I'd say if there's one thing that I could have done over here, it was that I didn't use counter stance with cloud. I feel like that would have really helped me and deal with his constant attacks. And then with Yuffie, there's also Brumal Form, and I'm aware of the Brumal Form-centered strategy to defeat Gilgamesh. I wanted to defeat him with my method, and I will consider making a different Brumal Form-centered video later. It's also worth noting that Gilgamesh is weak to fire, so fire ninjutsu and all of those fire materias that you have equipped can come in really handy, particularly if you have the infinite MP buff and you're not desperately trying not to wipe. And it's at this point that things get particularly dire. I managed to get only re-rays on Yuffie, and he's going to finish off Yuffie and I get bailed out by that one re-raise and I have to try to pick myself up and not be back at Phoenix and Kujata. And to further add to the complication, he's going to start his countdown for his ultimate move. I know that I have an out here as far as recovering, but I know that it depends on me raising Cloud and then getting enough ATB quickly enough for Cloud to get Limit Siphon off and then I use the level 3 limit on Gilgamesh. That's my only hope at this point. And meanwhile, I have to not die, so I have to just get a big distance with Yuffie and try to dodge all of his attacks. When you're trying to mount a comeback here, Daemon Wave and Gilgamesh Beam are both things that you want to press circle and go sideways on to get around. You got enough distance to pull that off. I did not on Daemon Wave here. I managed to not only arise Cloud, but also squeeze one in on Aerith as well. I had to make a decision, either cure Yuffie or get Aerith up. I didn't feel like Yuffie's MP situation really afforded me a cure, so I just went for the arise. The most crucial moment in this battle for me personally is the fact that I'm able to get enough ATB with Aerith to do a full Kiraga while Cloud and Yuffie are both less than a thousand HP left. I'm finally able to get off Limit Siphon and more importantly, five minutes into this battle, get ATB ward up at last. Like, it's shocking that I managed to last this long and not die. And meanwhile, Gilgamesh is still at 90% health. I've barely done any damage. I'm gonna fire off the level three limit and stagger him, and you see me very visibly give a sigh of relief. I have pulled off a miracle comeback. I don't believe that I need to show you a perfect beatdown every time on every battle. I think there's a lot of value in showing a really sloppy comeback because in reality 
you guys are trying to just get this win, you're probably not concerned about setting a world record by any means. And I feel like if there was ever a fight to show an amazing comeback, it's what I just did here. And because of how dire my situation was, I basically get to fire off a back-to-back -back level three limit by siphoning again. And on that second limit, I'm also able to use the infinite MP move again and finally try to get established in this battle. Because Radiant Ward has also been put up, I know that I can begin to try to cast these spells like re-rays and reliably get them off now because the Radiant Ward adds this invincibility effect on your spell cast. I stagger Gilgamesh again and I am now fully buffed and comfortable in this battle. It's incredible how quickly things can change even when they look as hopeless as they did earlier in this fight. And Gilgamesh is going to emerge from his stagger and be immediately greeted by yet again another level three limit to continue to keep him under control and under constant duress where I can impose my will on this fight. On this second stagger though, you see me really stop and think and try to make sure that I make the correct decision. I highly recommend you use those action menus to your advantage in that manner. Looking back, I feel like I missed an opportunity here to throw up Arcane Ward on Aerith in particular and start to cast at least Fyra's on it while I was still in the infinite MP phase. But at this point, I'm nitpicking and it would have just sped up the battle. What I did do well here, though, is ensure that I pulled off getting the limit gauge to Cloud and be ready to greet Gilgamesh with that limit. As my infinite MP wears off, I get a fresh mana wall up, though, and all the fresh buffs and I am ready to close this fight out. In this constant offensive onslaught that I'm now giving to Gilgamesh, he appears to keep dropping his weapons, and now I think I'm messing with Gilgamesh instead of him messing with me. For the time being, the Limit Break party is over, and I shift my focus on just trying to be smart and get to my next wave of those. So I want to try to use as much fire ninjutsu as possible while in the ATB ward. Using the infinite MP synergy skill while Gilgamesh is not under duress is certainly a tough choice you have to make. Getting locked into that animation puts your characters very vulnerable to getting demolished by one of his AoE attacks but I made the decision to go ahead and do that here. My rationale was that Yuffie was having significant MP issues all battle long, and I absolutely could not afford for Mana Wall to wear off. I'm able to just barely get enough limit to pull off another Siphon and use another limit to put Gilgamesh very close to being staggered at just about the final moment I possibly could before things were about to go very south for me again. And I'm in a really good spot here because the infinite MP buff is up already, so I don't have to spend the stagger using that synergy skill. I'm able to make sure my buffs are topped off and it gives me a really good opportunity to finally start casting a couple of Fyragas, even if late in the battle. And that really proves to be the difference maker here. It's honestly shocking that I was able to win this, given how many early mistakes that I made. But if this video shows you anything, it's that 
you can make mistakes and you still can recover and find yourself advancing to Sephiroth. Now, I'm about to advance to Sephiroth sight unseen and do my first attempt. So I honestly don't even know what to expect next, but let's get into round five. Round five is an enhanced version of Sephiroth, and I know that I probably need to get Mana Wall up as quickly as possible, so that's my main goal here. Using a double triple slash with Cloud went perfectly, and I was able to give ATB to the rest of the party to do a lot of my early buffs that I wanted to do. Your primary goal throughout this entire fight against Sephiroth is to keep your HP as high as possible at all times, and also at all times to maintain Mana Wall. Now, watching this back, I didn't know it at the time, but I believe that just Barrier is sufficient to survive here. You don't necessarily need the wall, but it certainly helps. So if you're short on MP, go ahead and just use Barrier instead. What Sephiroth is going to do though is bind each of your party members one by one based on who you're playing as, and then use a move called Octo Slash, which if you're at full HP and you have Barrier up, is a very manageable thing to happen. If you are not prepared for it, though, you're probably going to wipe because you can't stop it once it starts. I would say that I got off to a near perfect start. My one and only mistake in the first minute was not only misclicking Radiant Ward and using Chrono Aegis instead, but it wouldn't have mattered because I used it at a terrible time and immediately got interrupted. If I had properly executed that Radiant Ward, I think that this battle would have gone shockingly smoothly because what you're going to see is me attempt to do a Curaga after successfully getting infinite MP and that Curaga get interrupted. And if Radiant Ward had been up, that wouldn't have happened and it would have drastically changed the trajectory of this fight. Instead, I am going to get put in an unthinkable situation and that is getting most of my party knocked out except for Cloud being left at one HP. Despite everything that went wrong though, I'm actually still kind of in pretty good shape here because everyone survives Octo Slash and I immediately cast a magnified Curaga as Aerith. And the only thing that I have a problem with what I did was as Yuffie, I should have just kept dodging until after the Curaga had fully hit. I think that's what you should do in this situation. Instead, I try to quickly cast a re-raise on someone and get taken out a, about a quarter second before Kiraga would have hit Yuffie. So now what happens instead is I have to arise Yuffie and Yuffie has no ATB and Mana Wall is going to wear off here. I try to quick cast Cura on Yuffie to try to save her before this impending Octo Slash, but in reality, she was just doomed from the beginning. And if anything, I should have done Barrier or Brumal form here. 
I am put in an unthinkable situation, and that is my whole entire party, except for Cloud, is dead, and Cloud has one HP. And the only thing I have going for me is that I just hit level 3 limit without using a siphon. And also, the other one good thing that I had going for me is that Aerith actually had re-raise on. So I take my 15 seconds of invincibility and I know that I need to get ATB with Aerith very fast. And just like that, I have essentially cemented myself as the comeback kid on these battles. It's incredible how close I was to my run being over on both Gilgamesh and Sephiroth. I do a really good job here of immediately casting Cura and Barrier regardless of whether or not I'm in infinite MP and I have a second chance here. My one regret is that I kind of botched keeping Aerith alive here and she goes back down again. So the comeback's not fully complete but it's looking a lot better than it was a minute or two ago. It's really obvious to me what the correct play was in this situation, and that is exactly what I do. Try to get Cloud's Limit ready, and try to get Aerith back up, and get another 15 seconds plus a stagger of peace. Unfortunately, Yuffie doesn't survive this sequence, but I get Sephiroth staggered, and when you stagger him, the chains release the bound characters and you get kind of a fresh start. Now, hindsight's always 2020, but watching this back, it was very clear what I should have done here. I should have casted the Arise as Aerith instead of Cloud, and I should have immediately limit siphoned Yuffie and fired off the limit again to complete this recovery. I did not do that, so I'm left to still fight for my survival. And instead, Cloud's going to get immediately bound for another Octo Slash, and I'm back to survival mode. But I am able to get my infinite MP synergy skill off here. I do a really good job of utilizing Yuffie's evasiveness and take an opportunity to finally get some meaningful re-raises up with full buffs as well. For the first time in probably five minutes, I'm going to get Octo Slashed with Barrier Up and full HP. It's incredible that I was able to bounce back like this. I'm also going to be in a good situation as far as the limit gauge goes. Because I'm eating another Octo Slash and not wiping, they're going to both be close to full and I'll have an opportunity here to siphon Yuffie and leave Yuffie with a still very high limit gauge. There's just a couple of small problems here. This battle has dragged on so long that ATB Ward has disappeared, and that's a new problem, so I have to get that up, and I still have yet to manage to get Radiant Ward up. It just hasn't worked. It's really hard to cast wards when you're constantly having to spam Kiraga and Arise. I see Aerith bound and almost out of her misery, so I realize I have to cast Cure on her somehow, even though I did get this limit off and things are starting to look up. I'm not out of the woods yet though, in my opinion. Yuffie is completely out of MP, and I have to use Purification level 3 outside of a stagger, which is far less than ideal, but I feel like I don't have a choice here. And remember, this is my first attempt at Sephiroth, so I have no idea what's coming. When Sephiroth hits 50% health, he uses an elemental affinity move. That elemental affinity happens to be fire. So out of nowhere, when things are about to turn south for me again, they very rapidly turn great for me because Sephiroth all of a sudden is curing my party. It was an absolutely breathtaking turn of events 
for me and it helped me win. Now, I do not know if Sephiroth's elemental affinities come in the same order or they are random. I may have just gotten lucky here that fire happened first. But I know that I still need to get all these buffs back up and get my HP full because for all I know, Octo Slash is still right around the corner. I made some pretty bold moves here, like getting my wards back up while Aerith's HP was still low. And I was right, Octo Slash was right around the corner, but it didn't involve the characters being bound anymore. Aerith gets taken out again, but she has re-raise and Sephiroth so close to being staggered that I have an opportunity to just pull it off outright without siphoning first. I start mashing focus thrust and I'm able to get one off and actually stagger them. Getting Sephiroth staggered again is going to give me an opportunity to get my health full, summon Gilgamesh, and get myself in a position to try to finish this fight. Additionally, I'm in a really good spot limit-wise. I essentially have two level 3 limit breaks ready to go. This is an absolutely golden opportunity for me to get about 60 seconds of imposing my will on Sephiroth and taking complete and total control of this battle on my own terms. I'm still thinking very carefully on how I go about doing this and my plan is that I do do the full buffs on everyone, including things like Doppelganger, because I feel like at this point, I'm not going to get KO'd again, and if I do, it's not going to be for a while. Additionally, Yuffie's MP is in such dire shape that I need to just burn ATB to try to get another level three purification off. Normally, Gilgamesh will interrupt a lot of monsters' actions, even using Pinwheel. That's not the case here on Sephiroth. You can deal a lot of damage with Gilgamesh, but Gilgamesh alone is not going to interrupt Sephiroth. All in all, I feel like the elemental affinity phase of Sephiroth is easier than the first phase because he's no longer binding your characters and it makes things a lot more manageable. It's important though that you do a full-blown mana wall and not just barrier now because you need to defend against those other elements. At this point, I know that if I get Limit Siphon off and I fire off that next limit, I pretty much have this fight in the bag at this point. Because I know once I get that limit off, Gilgamesh is also a short time away from his ultimate ability also being ready for another quad nine attack. What I did get better at as this fight progressed was picking smarter moments to use my ATB abilities where they won't get interrupted. And that's exactly what I did here. At this point, because every character has re-raise up, I could have done a full wipe and still won this because Gilgamesh would have just used his finishing move. This battle is completely won. All it took though were a couple of melee attacks and clicking a pinwheel that didn't even go off. It took two unthinkable comebacks, but I managed to get this win. And I was far from perfect, but if I want you to take anything away from this video, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be good enough and you need to make good decisions in the heat of the moment. I now have a shiny new accessory that I will be doing a video on as far as how I like to use it and what my thoughts are on it. Don't get me wrong, it's a really good accessory, but you're not going to turn into an absolute world beater with it. Wow, so that was my first attempt on virtual Sephiroth and that was not 
too bad. I feel like I was pretty close to blowing it, but it was me just kind of getting used to them in the beginning. But once you get past Gilgamesh, you've got a real shot at winning. I went one for three on Gilgamesh, and I think I wiped once to Odin early as well. So I believe this was attempt number five, and that went really well. Let me do some voiceovers. Thank you for joining me on Gatabud. Stay here Thank you for once again joining me here on Gatabud. It is time to get back to the solo legendary challenges and finish up the seven star hotel. I will see you again soon, my friends. Make sure to stick around.